what do you think of when you think of Latin America? You might think of specific memories. Sometimes I think Latin America is a feeling. It brings up colors, sounds, food, smells, music, dance, rich cultures, tremendous historical, political, cultural, and biological diversity, long histories of exploitation, pain, trauma, and destruction, colonialism, dictatorship, neocolonialism, intervention, hunger, poverty, war, masculinism, authoritarianism, and a new authoritarianism, including under the guise of the quote-unquote war on drugs led by the U.S. military as a form of re-intervention into domestic politics in the region by a foreign power. I think of the enforcement of violent inequities through subtle and overt means. Where do these forces of destruction come from? How do they manifest specifically in Latin America? How can we better understand their origin and their many faces today in order to create alternative possibilities? Alongside these long histories of exploitation and destruction, for the same reasons, Latin American history has also been marked by incredibly rich stories of resistance and present struggles for peace and justice. Latin American history and the present are replete with examples of counter-narratives and lessons about how to rethink the world and our role in it. Stories of resistance, revolts, revolutionaries, enslaved people freeing themselves and forming independent autonomous communities, movements, innovative tactics that we can learn from, struggles for the rights and livelihoods of black and Afro-descendant people, of indigenous peoples, and not just ideas about rights, but also different conceptions of autonomy and liberation. Latin America is full of histories of women's movement and women's resistance, struggles for dignity and the rights of trans people and queer people and their humanity, struggles for environmental justice and alternatives to neocolonial and extractive ideas of quote-unquote development, liberation theologies, interpretations of religious teachings to build conscious communities and movements for social justice, alternative propositions and practices, and ways of rethinking dominant economic models, rethinking hegemonic ideas of democracy, and rethinking how to create decolonial spaces. In all, it combines histories of struggle, trauma, destruction, and resistance, hope, alternatives, joy, and possibilities, not only as ideas, but as things being put into practice already. Latin America is full of rich histories of advanced societies growing and exchanging and developing sophisticated knowledge systems for thousands of years before European colonialism, and then resisting colonialism and enslavement for more than 500 years, resisting post-colonial states and their efforts at recolonization in the name of quote-unquote national liberation, resisting neocolonialism, intervention, and ongoing forms of subjugation, resisting inequity and inequality and how they've become institutionalized, structural, and systemic. It is full of people practicing alternative modes of thinking, of relating to each other, of relating to nature and living with it, of organizing societies and building old and new conceptions of peace. Does it make sense to think of Latin America as a region? On the one hand, the homogenization of all this complexity through narrow views of what Latinos or Latin America quote-unquote are can be very reductive and problematic. And this is precisely a strategy of the colonial project and its dominant narratives, to erase cultural plurality and trap it into the past. There's this narrative, for example, that we in Latin America are all just a mix that emerges out of the colonial period. If you turn on the TV, you might think that Latin America is just mestizos. It's a mix of everything and we all look like Shakira, Bad Bunny, or Diego Luna. Or me, white Latin Americans, light-skinned Latin Americans. But Latin America is so much more. Beyond the typical associations that dominate the popular imagination about the idea of Latin America, especially in a US context, there is so much greater depth to what Latin America is. Latin America is trans, queer, and femme. It's black, indigenous, Asian, Muslim, Jewish, full of spiritual and cultural diversity. This narrative that we're all united by, for example, the Catholic faith, really misses the picture because, indeed, there are more Catholic people living in Brazil and Mexico than any other country in the world. But there are also tons of other religions, including indigenous religious systems, Afro-descendant religions like Candomblé and Voodoo, East Asian religious systems, Islam, Judaism, growing numbers of Protestant Christians, non-Catholic Christians who are becoming a right-wing politicized force, 
clearly importing the model of right-wing religious radicalization that helped mobilize conservative voters in the United States, for example. Latin America is 20 countries and remaining colonized territories. Puerto Rico colonized by the US and Guadeloupe, Martinique, and French Guiana colonized by France. Latin America is more than 800 languages and countless ethno-linguistic groups. Latin America is the largest site of black diaspora in the world. It is the largest site of Lebanese diaspora in the world. And it's one of the largest sites of Jewish diasporas in the world. And so this effort to homogenize, to treat us all as one thing, to treat this vast, massive region as one thing under one umbrella term, like Latinidad, or Latin America, or mestizaje, is an erasure of difference, and it is the colonial narrative. By the way, you can find similar critiques of Latinidad in English-speaking contexts, and especially in the U.S. context, led primarily by Black Latin Americans and Afro-descendant peoples who may or may not identify as Latin American. And these critiques are super important. They have a lot of potential in helping us to rethink the borders and boundaries that enable systemic oppression and inequity. I'll link to some of them in our resources list. And if you're keeping up with our suggested readings list for this program, Popularte, you read a powerful account about this from Dash Harris. That's a great example. So on the one hand, we have to contend with this homogenization. On the other hand, we can imagine differently. We can challenge these totalizing perspectives and come up with a way to disrupt borders around what we consider we, around what is considered quote unquote familiar and around what we consider our communities. What would it look like to build a collective identity and struggle that does not collapse and erase our differences, but actually regards them as a strength? What would it look like to build a shared sense of being and solidarity that values difference instead of seeking to eliminate or assimilate it? So I want to spend today's conversation thinking about that. And we'll be joined later by two amazing guests who will help us in this discussion which will also open up in a few minutes so that we can hear from those of you following along in the audience. So please join the debate and add your comments to the chat box. All of that said, what is Latin America? The word itself might be a problem. Latin America is a colonial construct. The term has two main origins. The Americas get their name from Amerigo Vespucci, an Italian who sailed on behalf of the Portuguese and later the Spanish crown. The Latin part was added later in the 1830s and was popularized by people like Michel Chevalier, a French diplomat who claimed that Latin America had a racial affinity, a racial proximity, had more in common with Romance-speaking parts of Europe, specifically France, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, than it did with the United States. And we have to understand the historical context of this. He was arguing this in a moment when the United States is pursuing the Monroe Doctrine and Manifest Destiny and seeking to expand into many parts of the world. And France understands also that Spain is collapsing. So by saying that Latin America had a shared racial identity with Romance-speaking countries in Europe, they knew that they wouldn't have to compete very much with Spain, the colonizer country for most of them, which was becoming really unpopular in the region at the time, as most countries were either in the midst of independence wars or had recently attained their independence. So Latin and America, named after Amerigo Vespucci and named Latin by Michel Chevalier, a French imperialist, suggests that the concept itself is a colonial construct made with colonial intentions. It was about naming this land in order to control it, in order to claim it. So on the one hand, Latin America is a colonial construct with colonial intention behind the term. However, Latinoamericanismo is also an anti-colonial force that has surged as a way to build pan-Latin American consciousness, unity, identity, and struggle in order to build the potential idea of Latin America as an anti-colonial force, as an emancipatory project. That's the tension of this term. On the one hand, it's a colonial construct. On the other hand, it has the potential to build consciousness and struggle on the one hand, it can collapse too much difference. On the other hand, it can build a shared sense of identity and solidarity. The potential of the idea of Latin America is worth digging into. So to put it one way, I like to think that Latin America is organized imagination. 
it is an interweaving of colonial and neocolonial practices alongside attempts to find emancipation and liberation. So in a way, it makes as much sense to think of it as a region as it does to call the 54 countries in Africa a region, especially given how many of them are also colonial fictions like Latin America. African countries are born out of national boundaries drawn by European invaders over and through ethnically diverse areas. Does it make sense to think of any world area as a region just because it may share some histories of colonialism? This is a good question that we need to unpack. It is or it can be productive to think of Latin America as a region but if the aim is to build conscious communities and to equip ourselves with the tools to liberate, then it is crucial to proceed in this study critically, paying attention to how colonial impulses are written into language and the thought patterns that we've been taught to use in conceiving of this massive region as just quote unquote one thing. These narratives are much more common than some people think. So how do we identify and recognize and challenge colonial narratives? Has this ever happened to you? You're reading a source or watching a video that presents itself as a good documentary with high production value that promises it was made in consultation with real experts and historians, etc. And then as you're watching, you begin to notice some problems with it right away. For example, this is the BBC documentary Warriors from 2008 and the episode on Hernán Cortés. Explorers from Europe Traveling along its coast began to hear reports of a fabulous city somewhere deep inside the mysterious continent. There were tales of huge pyramids, of streets built on water, and of an emperor whose palaces were filled with gold. Okay, let's pause here for a second. I don't know if the word empire and applies because what you're talking about is a Eurocentric conception of what empires mean. And it's so weird to assume that you can just take those ideas developed over thousands of years and apply them in a completely different context. He ruled a brutal tribe called the Aztecs. Why qualify the Aztecs as brutal at the outset without offering much evidence? This is a weird way to begin a documentary by establishing that one side was backwards and barbaric, which suggests that the other was there really to save or civilize or bring progress and light to these places where there's backwardness and darkness. This is the most common telling of this history. Who had enslaved millions of people. Well, this is another word that, thinking about it from a U.S. audience perspective or English-speaking audience perspective, the word slavery means something in very different from what they're talking about. Tenochtitlan annexed territories and they demanded tribute. But to say that they enslaved millions is inaccurate, irresponsible, and problematic. It is also very, very common. And believed in human sacrifice. Okay, and here's really uh, the culmination of the colonial narrative. And they get to it within only like a minute of this show starting. This is the BBC telling us that these people had a strong bloodlust, that they believed ritualistically in spilling blood in order to appease their gods or satisfy their gods. And so that blood was something that they were obsessed with. And here again, I have to pause and ask, why always reduce the pre-colonial experience of city-states in Mesoamerica, including the Mayans in movies like Apocalypto, different and diverse and complicated and rich cultures to just bloodlust to sacrifice. But actually, as new archaeological and historical evidence has been uncovered over especially the last century, we find that the Aztecs were possibly more obsessed with flowers than they were with ritual sacrifice. Yes, ritual sacrifice formed a part of their religious practices. However, in their daily life, they were so much more obsessed with things like flowers. Flowers. They had a god of flowers who was a queer male character. They had massive botanical gardens. They planted pungent flowers everywhere. They were obsessed with taking showers. The Wait Latuani showered multiple times a day. Most people in Tenochtitlan showered daily. In Cusco and Machu Picchu, they had drainage systems. Meanwhile, in Tenochtitlan, they had an aqueduct that brought clean spring water from Chapultepec. 
They built a city on a lake using extremely advanced hydraulic geoengineering. They had zoos, a university, advanced medicine, markets. They developed hydroponic agriculture. And they were more obsessed with flowers than with blood or human sacrifice. But the fact that their story gets reduced to the latter and you never hear about the former, you only hear about blood and never hear about all of the other rich aspects of this culture is indicative of a selective narration of history, a colonial narrative of history. And this continues to permeate in the way Latin American politics are taught, in the way this history gets told, and in the way that we think about the conquest. Where do we get evidence for these claims? To be fair, there are pre-conquest texts that confirm that sacrifice might have been a part of Aztec and other Mesoamerican cultures. However, where we get this emphasis on sacrifice is actually the records kept by the Spanish conquerors themselves, the conquistadores, as they wrote an explicitly political narrative that helped to legitimize and legalize colonization. The conquest was extremely violent and they had to adhere to different ideas of morality, Christian theological and legal philosophies and justify their actions. According to the rules of law in Europe at the time, what was being done in the name of the crown was a violation of law, of Christian scripture and ethics. So in order to circumvent any consequence that might come from people realizing and challenging this illegitimate, illegal, extremely brutal and violent conquest, they presented these ideas of a backwards, violent culture that needed to be vanquished or it needed to be subjugated. Another important question in challenging the colonial narrative is to ask ourselves who were the conquistadores and what motivated them? The BBC show says that Hernán Cortés was a lawyer. He actually wasn't. He was a law school dropout. And this is really easy to know and confirm. This is day one stuff. The conquistadores were motivated by gold, resource acquisition, riches, and they were celebrated and glorified for their atrocious brutality and violence. We have to challenge the way these histories have been written because they were written with political intent. For example, the conquest of Tahuantinsuyo, what we now know as the quote-unquote Inca Empire, we have new evidence to suggest that Francisco Pizarro violated codes of conduct and codes of war and the laws of Spain in subduing Atahualpa, the last Inca, the last leader of Tahuantinsuyo. So we have to look critically at the evidence that we have. We have to be open to new evidence and we have to be willing to read the colonial record, not as fact, but as the politically motivated writings of people who had some material self-interest in writing the story in a specific way. It is really important that we call to question how we talk about this history because the way we tell that history is deeply problematic, incomplete, and it's bound to reproduce a lot of the colonial narratives and myths that have facilitated and legitimized colonization in these lands and in these cultures for more than 500 years. obrigação esclarecer os fatos e denunciar os riscos dessa aventura golpista para o país. Desde que fui eleita, parte da oposição inconformada pediu a recontagem dos votos, tentou anular as eleições e passou a conspirar pelo impeachment. Os derrotados mergulharam o país num estado permanente de instabilidade política, impedindo a recuperação da economia com o único objetivo de tomar à força o que não conquistaram nas urnas.
trabalho golpista para o país. Peço a todos os brasileiros que não se deixem enganar. I'll leave it there and allow these folks to introduce themselves. But um, just as a starting point, I mean, I can ask you a question like, California is a predominantly Latinx, uh, demographically speaking population. It's a predominantly Spanish speaking population. And California was colonized by the Spanish before it was colonized by the Mexicans, before it was colonized by the United States. And so thus a place like California challenge ideas of what Latin America is. Does California count as Latin America? But I mean, that's just kind of an open question. I'll, I'll open the, the, the floor to, to you folks. Um, let's see, um, from, from my screen, the first person in order is Rafael. Uh, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay, uh, what would you like me to tell the folks, uh, Michael? You can start by saying kind of like something about your research and what would be some of the most interesting insights that, that you, you can share, especially with a non-specialist audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can take it from there. Okay, so well, uh, my name's Rafael Delgadillo. I'm a fifth year PhD student in Latin American and Latino studies at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, the way, the best way to describe my research is I'm, I am looking at the historic, the historical connections between New Orleans, Louisiana and Latin America. Uh, my basic framework, my basic premise is that you can make a case that New Orleans is actually an embodiment of the Americas as a colonial project because it was colonized by the French, um, you know, it was established by the French for the first 45 years. Then um, it was passed on to the Spanish because the French were weak and they didn't want the territory to fall over to the, um, to the English. And uh, they gave it to the Spanish. And 40 years after that, we get the Louisiana Purchase, which is when, you know, the United States comes in. So for me, that's really, and, and I consider the first couple of decades of New Orleans being uh, in the United States, however you want to frame that, I consider that to be a colonial period. So for me, New Orleans is a physical space, a geographic space where three colonial powers, European colonial powers converge. And they influence a lot of different um, things in New Orleans history, particularly our contracts of blackness, which if you really get down into the weeds of it, there is a mix of, um, of the, the strict binary of race that, that the United States brings in. But before that, there was more of a, um, of a of a of a, a bit of a caste system in New Orleans. Not come, you know, it had only been around for 85 years before the United States came in, so it wasn't fully developed. But uh, the binary that the that you know that the Americans, the United States, comes in with, did really dis, uh, disrupt understandings of race in, in in New Orleans. And and if you look at the the history of the city, the fact that it led the Take Them Down movement, you know, that removed started con removing Confederate statues, the fact that that started in New Orleans is actually connected to that. But that would take a lot of, um, you know, that would take a lot of uh, a lot of explanation to do. But that's that's one way. I, I, I Forgive me for ranting on, but that's one way I could describe my research. That's excellent. Yeah, that's super interesting. Thank you. Um, Roxana, do you want to do you want to go next? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me, um, Michael. I'm really appreciative of the space and to get to talk about my research and in conversation with all of you. Um, so again, my name is Roxana. My pronouns are she, hers. I'm also a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz in the sociology department, and I'm getting a designated emphasis in Latin American and um, Latinx studies. Uh, so I think broadly, my research is looking at uh, the region of the Central Valley here in California. So I'm coming to you from uh, California and the Central Valley is an expansive region that is primarily agricultural and rural. Um, and it's typically not um, imagined as like what we think about um, when we imagine California, right? We think California is a blue state. We either imagine LA or the Bay Area such as San Francisco um, or Oakland. And we typically kind of, uh, invisibilize a lot of the rural uh, communities of color that exist in the state. Uh, and so part of me, um, part of my research is to bring, is to shed light on like the gender and racial and class dynamics um, that occur in this location to think about how rurality, um, like as an analytic in a geopolitical context uh, shapes um, how girls are able to either leave um, or stay in, in rural communities. 
And so in particular, how I see like connections with Latin America is that um, I do see that the Central Valley is very conducive to, um, you know, a billion dollar uh, production of, uh, you know, um, agricultural uh, uh, production, a billion dollar production. Um, and yet, like the people who uh, produce this bounty are the migrant farm workers that live in poverty and face environmental racism, uh, health disparities. And so here we are, um, here we have this case where we have um, immigrants that are, are racialized and face so many inequities are producing so much wealth for the state. Um, and so in a ways I like to draw on um, sort of uh, conceptions of morality to think about how it mimics like extraction or it, it, it um, materialize extraction of uh, rural uh, communities of color, both like their resources and their labor in the, way that, in the ways that it, it has uh, been mirrored in Latin America. Um, and I like to think about rurality a lot in relation to the US because we really don't talk a lot about rurality and rural communities of color when we imagine the US. The US and the global imaginary is also thought as like cosmopolitan and modern um, and sort of um, democratic. Uh, and so there's something to be said of naming the rural right back into the US to think about uh, its role in like um, imperial projects in Latin America. So for me, I, I'm thinking a lot with rurality and how I can make affinities with uh, the ways that indigenous communities um, in Mexico, for example, but in broader uh, Latin America are racialized through rurality and um, also made invisible as kind of a part of a, a distant past, right? Um, if we think about uh, rurality in relation to like a, a capitalist modern logic where um, it's kind of thought of as like pre-modern or pre-industrial uh, but rurality communities exist today right and they are also conducive and part of like what we can think of a late capitalist modernity and so uh, I'm also rethinking a lot about the kind of logics of time and space um, and how there's this progression between the rural and the urban, uh, right? If we move from the rural to the urban, we're kind of moving closer to modernity. That's kind of this broader story that we are told um, in relation to colonialism and capitalism. But if we sort of name the rural today, what kind of work does that do? And how can we think about uh, the sorts of activism that comes from these locations that may or may not look similar to like urban locations? So. It, there's there's a lot to be explored when we think about um, rural communities, and for me, it's very political to not like look outside of the U.S. for the rural because that's always kind of um, an impulse in academia to say like I want to study rural indigenous communities. I have to go outside of the U.S. But if we kind of bring it back here, uh, we can also talk about how imperialism happens within the US and we can connect um, the ways in which uh, immigrant communities of color in the US alongside other marginalized communities are um, exploited for their labor, um, resources and land are being extracted and exploited in a very similar ways that it is in Latin America. So to me, I think rurality is very important to make these broader connections with colonialism, capitalism, and imperialism. Um, so yeah, so there's just a lot of thoughts. I, I'm happy to continue uh, talking about it, but uh, I will leave it there and I will give the space to uh, uh, Maria. My name is, is Maria Jose. Uh, people call me Maho, but you can call me Maria as well. And I'm a, a fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows. So my research in, is in political science. And as, um, as Mike was saying, I do research on, on gang violence in Central America. And so maybe where I um, come at this question of Latinidad or um, what it means to be Latino and where the boundaries are drawn is that I think of that question in transnational terms. So I focus on, on gangs in Central America. I mean, they're 
located in Central America, right? But they're the product of um, transnational connections. And, uh, you know, if you wish, it's uh, what uh, Stephen Dudley in this book that he recently wrote called um, Must 13, The Making of, uh, of America's Most Notorious Gang. He calls it like the bastard child of uh, an affair that, you know, no one wants to acknowledge, right? And so that affair being really uh, an imperial affair between the United States and Central America and how uh, transnational gangs right are really a, a product of uh, both the the counterinsurgency wars in central america that drove off a lot of people a lot of young central americans to california right so um roxana has been talking about the space also you know being as one that you know in many ways right uh, was uh, uh, received a lot of these populations, displaced populations from Central America that were fleeing violence that was funded by the United States. They end up in, in, in California. And, you know, this is where they start finding each other, right? Um, as a support mechanism, right? A lot of them didn't speak English. They were living in uh, very poor neighborhoods. Parents were working um, all day long, right? And so in some ways um, they found each other for that support that they needed. They you know, these gangs, right, in, in, in many ways, uh, um, I think, you know, we heard in, in, in past years a lot about MS-13, um, but this, this was not a Salvadoran gang, right? Like this was a product of that, um, of that imperial connection or imperial marriage, if you wish. And, uh, and so that's a bit what my work uh, thinks about, right? And it's just, uh, what is this, um, um, how how maybe Latinidad or, or 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 these identities are born out of all of these these uh, cross border connections, right? And so it's not, um, I mean, in a way, identity um, is also is also, uh, I mean, a product, right, of sort of violent entanglements. Excellent, that's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you all so much. Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm seeing connections already, uh, thinking about MS-13 as not a Central American gang, but an LA gang, and what does that mean? Um, and I wanna pick up on a point that Roxana made, which is about uh, how rurality and campesinos, farmers, especially uh, uh, people who are also racialized and minoritized, uh, are trapped in the past. This idea of trapping trapping a certain history in the past is, is key to the colonial narrative. Latin America is a colonial construct. The story of Latin America is often told as beginning with the conquest, trapping whatever existed before in the past. Um, the story of that pre-colonial past is reduced to three extinct cultures, right? Three in quotes and then extinct in quotes. Uh, usually if you look up pre-Columbian cultures of the Americas, you, you read about the Incas, the Mayas, and the Aztecs, right, which collapses so many thousands of ethno-linguistic groups that existed here for tens of thousands of years that exchanged with each other, that were building alternative ways of relating to each other. And um, so that's another thing, how we think about Latin America, Latin America as a colonial construct. Um, and maybe another one, one juicy question that I have for all of you that maybe is, is more tangible is where do you draw your solidarities? And let me, let me kind of explain what I mean by this. When I come into a project like this, I think, yes, I'm finally doing the work that I wanted to do because I don't want to teach at like a rich, you know, liberal arts school in uh, New England. I want to teach uh, to my people. But then when I I've been thinking about that, that over the past 10 years. What does that mean? Where are my solidarities? With? I think of campesinos, I think of Latinx people, and I think of Latin Americans. I think of people like my grandparents who didn't have access to education, who had dark skin. Like that is who my solidarities, solidarities are with and who they are for. But the more I think about it, the more I'm, I'm willing to question the idea of where those boundaries are drawn, because why aren't my solidarities with the poor of the whole world, right? And why, why do I want to seek more in common with people who just simply speak the same European language that I speak, uh, uh, Spanish, and, and not with a Vietnamese person who has also been resisting imperialism and, uh, you know, colonialism. So that's, that's, that's a question for all of you is, where do you draw your, your solidarities? And what is that? How do you, how do you come to a question like that? Um, and I'll, I'll start with Rafael since, since we're uh, in this order. Okay, Michael, that is a lot, man. So which one, which question would you like for me to tackle first? Because I like all of them, but I can't cool. remember. 
Whichever you prefer. Honestly, this is this is a space for for us to make together, and I don't want to kind of dictate too much. But mm -hmm. if if you want, we can we can start with the last thing I said, which is where do you draw your solidarities, and do you think about the boundaries of what that means? Uh, I'll be honest with you, that's not something I've given much thought to. Um, you know, before I was an academic, I do have a past life as a as an activist. Um, I put that in quotations. I I, I was technically. My job description or the, my business card said community organizer for a nonprofit organization back home in New Orleans that was focused on working you know, with Latin American migrant communities throughout the metro area. And uh, the truth is, I, you know, as an organizer, I didn't do a good job. And there's lots of reasons for that. But one of them, I did the job for five years and to be a good organizer, it's gotta be a career. You know, it's something that you have to wake up and do. It's, it, it, it's gotta, you know, it, you, it's gonna take more than five years to master that profession. Oh, in order to be effective. Um, uh, but it made sense, you know, the, the organization, it's still around, although it's reduced its, its um, you know, it's reduced its, uh, its approach in many ways because um, it emerged after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. And, you know, for a lot of folks that don't know this, um, in the reconstruction effort to rebuild the city, a lot of migrants from Latin America and Latin American construction workers from the United States, born in and outside of the United States, uh, uh, converged on New Orleans um, in, uh, you know, as part of the reconstruction effort. Uh, at the same time, George W. Bush, the president at the time, of course, lifted, he did two things. He lifted the ban on, on the, he lifted the ban on hiring undocumented people while at the same time flooding the city with over 300 ICE agents, right? So, um, you know, it just, and that, Buendas was not the only organization doing this work, but it only made sense at that time in a city like New Orleans where there isn't a dominant group. You know, Hondurans have historically had the, uh, the plurality, even the majority, maybe back in the 80s and 90s, but now it's more of a plurality. It's a very diverse, um, as far as the Latin, you know, Latin American migrants are concerned. If you look at the metro area, there's communities from every, every country there. Um, and that work made sense because all of us we're having issues with access post Katrina. I don't want to get too much into it because there's a lot of us here, but there's, for me, I guess the, to reflect on that and, and you know, as Latinidad is an identity, post Katrina, it made sense where we were from because nobody else was looking out for, 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 for our folks, right? Now, at the same time, I also acknowledge that the only reason I would consider myself Latino, Latinx or whatever is because I'm Dominican, right? And that's really at the heart, you know, that's where I start from as far as identity. I'm a black Dominican who grew up in New Orleans, that really matters to me, right? Um, but it's, it, as a black person growing up in the deep South, when you start asking me where my solidarities are, man, that's a question where the answers just get fluid, you know? And because, you, you know, to, to be black in the deep South, I don't care where you're from, you have to know that you're black when you're in the deep South. I'm sure that's the case everywhere else, but that's something that, you know, um, I'm gonna stop right there, but that's something that I always had to keep in mind as I did the work that I did, as I lived in, in Louisiana. And with that, please pass it on to someone else. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Roxana, do you wanna go next? Sure, uh, thank you, um, Rafael. I think that uh, you gave me a lot of food for thought. Um, I, in thinking about that question, which is, yeah, it's, it's very loaded. Um, I think increasingly in thinking critically and self-reflexively about my role as an academic, right, or in, as a researcher, it's really kind of decentering, as you all mentioned, um, the university, the university and academia as like being um, the uh, knowledge producer that can uh, tell communities how they will be uh, saved from their different forms of marginalization. So. I think in a very simplistic way, I draw my solidarities with communities and struggle um, to sort of look to them as experts of their own life and also experts at uh, the type of change that they seek. Um, and I think that's just in general, my approach to how I view my work um, and, and you know, as a researcher um, and um, in, in some aspects a community activist, because I do agree that when you're in academia there, that that the difference of the type of activism that you can do is, is very different from the ones that are on the ground, right? And we, we can simultaneously do both, but um, it's a little trickier. 
And um, when you said that question, I've been thinking a lot about everything that sort of occurred in the year 2020 amidst the pandemic and so many upheavals that occurred around the world. And, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about how these crises are really just like ruptures of like a, a capitalism that no longer works and a settler colonialism that no longer works, right? And there are some ways in which we can create affinities between what looks like autonomous movements, we can think of like Black Lives Matter, right? Um, as well as like uh, str uh, indigenous struggles for, for getting land back, right? And um, even if we are to make that link with the insurrection at the Capitol, you know, there's something to be said about, you know, these, the, the, the construct of what we think as the nation state is no longer holding for us, right? There's something uh, occurring Right. Um, we are in the midst of so many like uh, crisis with uh, climate change. Right. So we're not only seeing um, struggles around people, but also uh, uh, increasingly a lot of um, natural disasters. Right. Um, we're also seeing climate refugees. So it's not only political refugees, but also people who are heavily impacted uh, by natural disasters. So to me, I feel like to be in true solidarity is to recognize how all of these things are happening because there is, you know, we're, we're getting to the point where capitalist, there's finite resources that capitalism can extract, both in terms of like labor and also like natural resources. And I think that's the way we, we sh in which we can connect all these different um, systems of power, but also the same struggles. So for me, I think the solidarity is to think about these broader connections instead of seeing ourselves separate from both our identities and also like separate as nation states. So when you mentioned before borders, I was, I was thinking about not only national borders, but the borders we put between ourselves and our identities while also recognizing that we are different. We are differently, definitely, um, policed and impacted by these systems in, in different ways. But I think that if we are to build solidarity, uh, we should definitely connect, the, connect it back to like the way that these systems of power intersect with one another. So we can think about white supremacy in relation to patriarchy, to think about feminicide um, and the ways in which like indigenous um, women have gone missing and continue to do so. And as well as um, the police violence waged against black women, right? And so I think that in relation to these broader discourses of get our, getting our land back and uh, BLM protests. So I guess for me, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about how, yeah, how can we create the conversation where we um, turn kind of the view back on the state um, policies on um, uh, imperial projects. Um, and I'm thinking uh, a lot today uh, about Palestine and you know how we're still witnessing uh, settler colonialism today and how can we yeah, how can we draw solidarities uh, full, knowing full well the histories of Latin America and also um, and thinking even uh, today about the way like black migrants are treated in Mexico, for example, um, based on the article that you suggested. Um, there's immigration policies that are uh, very parallel to the US immigration policies that are keeping people out. And so there's a way to, to think about these connections, right? As opposed to solely thinking about uh, the border that's placed between the US and Mexico border. We can think about other borders um, that are doing these co colonial uh, projects, right? Of um, not only keeping people out, but really um, neglecting them, right? Exposing them to death um, in a systematic way. So in a long-winded way, I guess my, my solidarity is to come back to these to these communities and to these movements, um, not as you know an expert, but as a very, very uh, humble person that's willing to learn like how, because I'm sure everyone on the ground has in thinking about these connections and these affinities um, in much more concrete ways than us academics have uh, the exposure to do. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um.
That's excellent. Thank you so much. Maho, do you want to go next? I'll just echo Roxana on how solidarity has to be thought in, in intersectional ways. And the reason is because, you know, solidarity can be also a very exclusionary thing, right? I mean, you can be in solidarity with a certain, you know, people can be in solidarity with Israel right now, right? Um, as they're bombing Gaza, like people can be in solidarity, I mean, and, and, and the other way around, right? And so I don't, you know, solidarity is like, we use it almost as it's like a positive term. And I think it is, and we have to, you know, maybe like recover it as such, but it, you know, not necessarily, right? Like, um, you know, it can, it, it can create its own exclusions. And so like solidarity in a way, it, it has to be thought in a much more expansive way, right? Like, so you have to have a good sense, I guess, of the structures of oppression that you're facing, um, or one has to have a, like a broad sense of what they look like, um, you know, how they're not just local, right? They're also global. Um, and then, you know, how, like, you know, so then how, how do you go about, right, confronting these structures? And when you realize, I think that, you know, so many of our problems are global, right, that you can't, you know, that if, like, workers stop uh, here in the U.S., right, you know, well, jobs are just going to transfer to, like, somewhere in, I don't know, Honduras, right? And then, you know, they keep, uh, like, a lot of the problems that I think we're facing across the world, like, they, they need global responses and global organizing. And if it means then that solidarity, you know, has to look global, it's a challenge, right? Um, it's not easy to work across differences. And I think, uh, but one has to, right? Um, so I think that, uh, at least for me, thinking about um, solidarity means really thinking about how to connect across difference, like without homogenizing, right? So it's like keeping those together, right? Like a solidarity that does not erase difference because the solidarity that erases difference is, uh, you know, is the violent one, right? And it's like the one that can be in solidarity with white supremacists. Um, so, you know, keeping, I think that in mind is, is, is important, but, you know, just, I guess beyond the abstract or, or this abstract thought, um, I think for me, the, or at least Mike, when I was uh, listening to you and, you know, sort of like the way that you connect with, um, you know, Latin organizations, peoples, right, and just, you know, in, in that history, the, like for me, you know, I don't know if that's Latinidad, but right, for me, it, it, it figures as a political identity. So, and it's a political identity that has been, that it's internationalist as it, at its core. So when you think about, um, I mean, I grew up in Honduras, right? But I grew up reading Eduardo Galeano from like this, you know, you should all read him if you haven't, um, you know, Uruguayan writer, beautiful stories. And it was the first time, so reading his stories, um, the book is upside down. Um, I, it was the first time that I, you know, that I could, connect to a sort of Latino identity or like Latin American identity, you know, I don't know how to call it, right? But, and the connection there for me was that, you know, it was an identity, it was not just, you know, cultural, right? Like food or, 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 or language, like that almost doesn't matter to me because, you know, if you connect over Spanish, like, you know, Spanish is like, it's pretty colonial, right? Like in how it's also has homogenized um, so many, as, like has destroyed, right? The many indigenous languages in Latin America. So for me, that connection was more like the spirit of anti-imperialism, right? That was highly internationalist, right? So if you think about, you know, and I don't want to glorify, right? Like, you know, it, the Cubans, right? But like, you know, Cubans were sending, like we're sending support to Angola during its independence movement. Like what other country was doing that, right? Like to help the decolonizing effort in Africa, right? So you have this legacy, I think in Latin America that it's, uh, you know, important to recover in a way or like to hold, uh, um, to hold up um, that is, is based you know, it's place-based, and if you wish, right? Like, it's still, it's not this abstract thing, right? Because we connect in, in our communities. Like, we connect with, you know, the people who surround us, right? Um, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's also a place-based connection that then allows, right, for, like, making that jump um, and connecting across continents. So I think that's what's exciting for me about, um, you know, somehow, or, like, what, you know, like, I don't know if, if any of you have watched, um, I mean, and I know Calle Tres is a little controversial for some, but, right, he has this song, Lat Lat uh, Latinoamerica, 
right? And if I, when I listened to that song, like, or when I first listened to that song, I just cried, like I couldn't stop crying. And I think, you know, part of it, it was like here in the US and, and whatever, right, missing, missing home. Um, but it was like what I, I think as I analyzed or like my reaction, it was really this, uh, just this spirit, right, of like, you know, of, of, of a political struggle against dictatorship, of a political struggle against um, dispossession, a political struggle for equality, right, that is like longstanding, um, you know, that is still vibrant, I think, as Mike was telling us, uh, you know, through the video, through the narration of the video, right, um, so I think that's what's exciting to connect for me. That's incredible. Okay, so this really helps to kind of bring us back to the theme of the video that I will make sure to share. All of the participants will get a copy. It'll get uploaded today. But the, the, the crux, the, the punchline of it was um, asking exactly these questions of how do we recognize erasure and what gets collapsed, but also recognize that historically Latino Americanismo has risen up, especially since the mid 1800s onward, has been taken up by people trying to build also a shared anti-colonial struggle identity and consciousness to build an internationalist solidarity with the poor, with the oppressed, with the subaltern of the world um, that involves South-South co cooperation, not only within the region, but with other countries, right? So thinking about the Cuba-Angola connection, just to kind of wrap it up for, for the audience on this question of Latin American identities and, and the borders that we draw and the way they reproduce colonial narratives and therefore reify and legitimize colonial relationships of power and material everyday lived conditions. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Do you have a, a preferred position on this? Do you think that uh, uh, it, it is better to just abandon the idea of Latin America? Or, or would somebody like me, a white Latin American who doesn't come from a big moneyed family, but by all means, I had white privilege all of my life growing up in Mexico. Um, for somebody like me to appropriate the concept of Abyayala also seems like it raises questions. I, again, very important and loaded question that I think I'm still working through, but I, I think something that I picked up on what you said is we can think of um, creating affinity across Latin America through this concept of Latinidad as like a political project that can foster these connections, both historically and also thinking about contemporary uh, struggles. How do we um, simultaneously um, negotiate and push against, um, you know, capitalism and colonialism, um, as well as white supremacy, right? We have all these different systems of power that come together. But at the same time, in thinking about this in, in a very global and homogenous way, we do lose sight of the way these systems of power um, sort of manifest regionally in very particular ways. And, and, and I think, Maho, you said, very place-based. Place and I think there's um, often this duality that is placed against the global and the local where there's a binary between those two. Um, and I think uh, sometimes Latinidad is sort of um, made synonymous with that global part, right? Um, and it's juxtaposed against the local. So I think there's a need to sort of um, destabilize these binaries that work under that umbrella um, to really think about how we can create affinities through difference in recognizing that the way that someone is racialized in Mexico is very much different from the way someone is racialized in Brazil. And then further, even within these nations, these processes of racialization are always uh, gendered um, and sexualized in particular ways. And this does have differences when we look at rural and urban spaces, especially because sometimes like urbanization and industrialization within Latin America is often striving towards this idea of modernity that tries to mimic the US, right? And those are used against indigenous communities, uh, black communities um, to uh, police them, right? Um, uh, and to render them, sort of render their lives um, either invisible, right, or um, sort of exposed to death in different ways. And I think that when we... Um, I, uh, 
I want to thank you all um, for, for this conversation. Uh, and as we think through uh, identity, Latinidad, you're all absolutely right. It's a very limited concept for an entire like continent, dozens of countries, millions of people. And you know, it goes without saying that in these conversations about Latinidad, uh, that often we leave out Brazil and Portuguese uh, as part of that conversation. Um, and wanting to bring it back, you know, continue to summarize this for, for us. Uh, and any questions from the audience, I wanna make sure that we continue to set this as the foundation that'll guide the rest of Popularte. And that uh, if you all have any quick comments about the readings and how in order for us to work towards Latinidad, there's this blancamiento process that takes place throughout that, that narrative that we're trying to challenge with Popularte and really continuing to, uh, to make those abstract concepts work for us in our relationships and our international solidarity. Uh, so with that, I wanna invite the audience, if y'all have any questions or any points of clarification uh, that you wanna add um, to it, uh, especially I wanna extend the invitation to the attendees joining us from Brazil. Uh, what do you all think about what you just heard? Uh, a lot of this was very, uh, U.S. centric uh, to the Valley in California, uh, to Louisiana. Uh, how does all this land or resonate with you all in in uh, in Brazil? And uh, if you could include that in the chat, uh, and Julia, if you could help us facilitate that conversation uh, in Portuguese, uh, that would be great. Um, so. Maybe while we wait for some answers to file into the chat room, can we just give uh, Rafael and Maho a chance to, to make their final statements? Please. Cool. So let's let's go to Maho, if you don't mind. I'm I'm okay with with just listening to also the the attendees, like especially you know given how I think uh, you know this this uh, they're, they're the most important part of of uh, of, uh, of the event. Uh, but you know, just also, I don't have strong, uh, strong feelings about it. In, in a, you know, I welcome, I welcome the expansion of concepts. I think concepts are always contested, and so I think they need to be reinvigorated. But yeah, just happy to uh, pass it on to Rafael or here from the attendees. Um, I, I guess I'll more or less uh, echo Maho on that. Um, with questions, I think that's a good question, Mike. At the same time, questions like that remind me that we're privileged to be in this academic space. Where that question even matters, um, you know. Uh, when I think about folks that that I that I've lived with, I'm not going to cite myself as an organizer or as an academic. Just in life, these aren't conversations they have, right? Like the concept of Latin America being abolished is not something that 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 you know some Puerto Rican working uh, in Florida at a McDonald's is thinking about, you know, or or somebody that's trying to make it, you know, trying to apply for uh, for a job, you know. So I'm not trying to be dismissive of it. But like questions like that, you know, when I was actually an organizer, that's a question that never came up, right? And um, and I just want to acknowledge that. I'm not saying that it's not worth our time, but you know, that's that's a constant um, uh, topic of conversations between you and I. So I just wanted to state that. Yeah, yeah. It, it really is a question of what are the practical stakes of this, right? Are there practical stakes of this, or is this just pure academic over intellectualizing? And that's a big part of why I appreciate this discussion. But let's see if, if we have a, especially responses from Negrafica. What I wanted to do as we close this discussion was to ask Negrafica for their comments. And so I, I appreciate, Alfredo, that you mentioned that this is a US centric conversation. How does this land from a Brazilian perspective and especially from the, the, the women in Negrafica? Uh, yeah, so I'm seeing here that Leticia. Moreno, who's part of Negrafica, uh, has a few words that she would like to share. So I will uh, promote them to a panelist as well. Uh, and we can continue to bring it back to, to Popularte and the workshop series that we'll be embarking on here shortly. Uh, and I will promote them uh, now as a panelist. And they will be joining us shortly. <laughs> 
and I guess I'll say a couple of things that to me have been really fascinating that people, we demand categories because that's how our mind works. You know, we, we need concepts to compare, to build knowledge on concepts, but the world doesn't exist in concepts. Uh, so that to me has been something that's been really fascinating of how do we take a cue from nature and from land that doesn't demand binaries, that, you know, light, matter can exist in all places at once. It doesn't need to be confined or categorized. So how is it that we take a cue again from nature and stop demanding that we fit into these really neat categories because inevitably someone will be left out. And that's the colonial violence of demanding that we all fit into little categories. Uh, so that to me is the, the takeaway uh, in, in the conversation that, that we had. Uh, let's see, in asking Leticia to start video, uh, we'll see if that works and we'll do that translation. Um, and then we'll uh, do some closing remarks here at 725. Um, so I wanna be respectful of y'all's time with that. Um, let's see if we have Leticia. Oh, and here they are. Yay, welcome. Yeah, I think it's working now. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so um, I'm going to try a little bit in English, but maybe I'll mix it with Portuguese if that's okay, because it's not my first language, you know, so <laughs> I may. <laughs> so the thing is, I was talking to the girls while we were watching the panel um, about we how we as Brazilians, we don't get the Latinidad sense that much and um, I was discussing with with them that I how can we um, have this kind of sense in our daily lives because um, I see I understand Brazil and Latin America as a whole but um, on the daily basis it actually we don't feel that we are connected with Latin America and I really don't understand why that happens and we were thinking that maybe because they tried to we have a thing that we call here in Brazil the stray dog syndrome mm. that we um tend to like more, to cherish more things that are from the United States and things that are from Brazil. We like, we don't really enjoy. We really think that things that come from, you know, Europe and United States are better. And I think that maybe this is the reason we really don't see ourselves as part of Latin America. And we don't have that actual sense of discussing, um, how can I put this out? I, I, it might make sense because <laughs> this is actually my first time trying to put this out in English. So I mean, um, it's great. Keep going. <laughs> so I, I really, we were trying to understand why that happens here, why we don't feel part of Latin America, even though um, we had the same cultural basis with the, with the have the same exploration from um, the only difference that what happened here was with Portugal. So we speak Portuguese, but how things developed here are really similar. So that was the, the thing that we was discussing while watching the panel. And um, I think that's it. <laughs> mm. You know, and I think that's, a, again, a really important part of the conversation that Brazil dominates geographically such a huge part of South America. But then, you know, for you not to feel like you're included in Latinidad, but in the States, Latinidad is the catch-all term, you know, for everybody. But even then, it leaves millions and millions of people out. And now there's talk around Latinx, being the next term that like captures everybody. But, you know, there's a recent Pew study 
that said that only like one to 3% of people identify with Latinx or know what that is. So there's, there's this really big tension there that throughout the rest of the workshops, we'll continue to explore about what is Latin America and how do we make how do we make it more inclusive in a way that makes us feel good about ourselves and not exclude people who don't look like us, who don't talk like us, who don't worship like us, who don't love like us. And that's the, that's the direction that Popularte will take us in. How do we use art to break down those barriers, not only to how we understand our experience, how we understand the world around us, but also how do we create in a more inclusive and sustainable way. Um, so again, being mindful of our time, we have about three minutes. So any concise statements from the other panelists in response to Leticia or any last takeaways about Latinidad and making it more expansive uh, before we move on to closing uh, remarks. I just wanted to reiterate something Maho said, which is that um, how do we build solidarities, alliances, shared struggle and consciousness without collapsing our differences, without seeking to eliminate or assimilate them? And that really is the tension that animates me, right? Beyond the purely academic theoretical debates that are mostly US centric. No, I was just reflecting on what Leticia was saying and, and you know, uh, hearing from someone who's Brazilian that they don't feel included in this idea of Latinidad. And I'm, you know, I'm making plans with my family to visit the Dominican Republic this summer to see some relatives. And I can tell you, you know, do Dominicans consider themselves part of Latin America? Yes, that's not a conversation anybody's gonna have while I'm there, right? It's our Latinidad. We're gonna be proud of Dominicanness and being Dominicans. And my Latinidad is only gonna matter once I leave the Dominican Republic, right? To them, to my relatives in DR, I'm gonna be a Yankee, you know? And they'll call me that to my face, right? So. Um, so it gets complicated. And for me, as I reflect on it, I think about what, what was one of the platforms that reinforced my identity as a, as a Latino, right? It was Univision, because in New Orleans, it's the only Spanish channel we had. And there was nothing, there was rarely ever anything on about Brazil, rarely anything about Portuguese, but it was about reinforcing this idea that we have to be racialized, right? As a, as a migrant group in the United States, which I'll admit for me, it does make sense to a certain degree that we coalesce around certain issues that affect us, but we're not a racial group, right? Me, Michael, me and you are both Latinos, but we are not the same race. You know, that's just not, that's not gonna happen. And, and by the way, there's an experience I had in your apartment complex a couple of years ago that reflects that. When I got, when one of your neighbors called the cops on me and ran me out of your neighborhood while I was waiting for you and demanded that, that I identify myself and called the police until, until you backed out, until you managed to get in your car, pick me up, and, and drive me away, right? And so yeah. there's a lot of things there that, that we have to, you know, that we have to reflect on when we're thinking about Latinidad, right? I think it's really important to point out that this was a Mexican person, right? So thinking again about Mexican nationalism as chauvinistic, as not necessarily a decolonial, anti-colonial force. If you ask a Hopi person, Pueblo, Navajo person, if you ask Geronimo and read his life story, if you ask Central American refugees traveling through Mexico, Mexican nationalism is, I mean, even the identity of Mexicanity, right? If you want to go take it from Lat Latinidad to Mexicanity, I mean, these are, these are colonial constructs that are, uh, uh, produced in order to, to widen society. But sorry, I'm talking too much. Let me open space for other folks who want to throw a comment. There was a, a really good comment that came from the chat from Amaya, uh, who following up with Leticia mentioned that perhaps that's part of the, the exclusion to diminish Brazil so that you don't have to um, focus on the marginalization that exists there uh, and the exploitation. Uh, that it's easier to ignore that stray dog, uh, as Leticia mentioned, uh, when they don't quite fit anywhere else. Uh, and with that, I, I want to thank the panelists for a great conversation. Uh, it's great to see you all. Uh, and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Hasta luego.